Okay, so good afternoon. This is House Government Operations. Um, we we're taking up two bills this afternoon and getting testimony and hopefully marking them up and voting. Um, the first bill is S-22, an act relating to authorizing temporary open meeting law procedures, specifically remote meeting, and um, S-223, an act relating to authorizing temporary election procedures. Um, and we have a number of witnesses with us today. Um, and I believe our first witness is um, the Secretary of State Deputy Director Chris Winters, or Deputy, excuse me, Deputy Secretary of State Chris Winters. Thank you, Representative Gannon. I, I appreciate that. Uh, deputy, indeed. Uh, my voice is, is a little funny today. I, maybe I can do a little <laughs> Western drawl to really play up the deputy role here. Uh, <clears throat> I may cough and sneeze a little bit through this, so I apologize in advance. Um, with respect to the temporary open meeting law provisions, we, we really appreciate that the legislature has taken this one uh, up quickly as well. Uh, the Senate did some, some fast work on that to get it over to you, and we appreciate you making time to take a look at it here today. Um, really, what, what it mainly does that we were most concerned about is to allow towns to meet without the physical meeting space requirement that uh, that is there under the existing open meeting law. That was temporarily waived during the state of emergency, as you all may recall, that expired. Um, that meant that uh, public bodies had to go back to meeting. Um, they could still meet remotely, but they had to have at least a, a physical location where the public could attend, and that had to be staffed or uh, attended by at least one of the public body members or one of their staff members to allow for the public to attend in person if they wanted to. <laughs> Given the uptick in cases and the spike that we're in the middle of right now, uh, many people thought that it made sense to waive that physical meeting requirement again. And I think you'll hear from some people on the line today who can give you specific instances as to why that made sense for them. Um, on the Senate side, we uh, advocated that this be temporary, temporary for sure, um, because you do also have to think about the, the public's um, perception of this and the public's access to meetings. Um, and for some people, Zoom is not easy or telephone is not ideal. Um, so that physical ability to, to attend in person is important, but we think it's uh, something that could be temporarily waived. Uh, the, the bill itself waives it through January of next year. Um, and I'll just note that, that we thought maybe that should be shorter. We were asking for an April date so that you could revisit it before you uh, adjourned for the session and see if, if cases had gone down, you could reinstate the physical uh, meeting place requirement. Uh, the committee thought, you know, we just don't know how we can anticipate what will happen this fall. Uh, they determined it was best to do it through January of 20. 23. Um, the one other thing that I'll note from the Secretary of State's office perspective is that the way this was written before, there was um, a, a telephone requirement, a phone option, and the words if feasible were in that language last time around. We asked that that if feasible, those two words, be removed, saying that if uh, you can't provide a phone option, um, then you shouldn't have the public meeting. And it just seems like everybody has figured that out. There is always a phone option available. Zoom has an automatic phone option in there. Um, so we thought it was best and the committee agreed that we leave in the requirement that if you're doing a fully remote meeting, that there also be the ability to call in by phone for those people who couldn't do Zoom perhaps might not have access to a computer. Um, so those are the two major things that, that I'll point out from the Secretary of State's office's perspective. We're okay with the bill as written um, and uh, glad to hear um, some of the other people's perspective, the other folks testifying today uh, to understand their concerns about the bill. Thank you, Chris. Um, I am apologize in advance. I'm experiencing a little uh, internet difficulty. Representative Vyhovsky, go right ahead. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chris, for being here and, and helping us prioritize this to give towns the ability to have the flexibility they need. Um, I wanted to clarify, and I'm pretty sure I, I do actually know the answer to this, but I got a specific question that I was sort of like, I think this is the case, but the telephone provision does not allow for towns to hold meetings by telephone only. It allows for town, it says that towns holding a remote meeting have to have that as an option, correct? I believe under existing open meeting law, that remote option is, is not limited to video. It could be telephone only. Um, I also have uh, Jenny Prosser from our office is on the line and I'm not sure I'm gonna put her on the spot here. I don't know if Jenny, if you have had any questions relating to this, but I do believe that meeting could be held telephone only and there's no requirement to actually have a video um, option available. Okay. <laughs> Jenny, are you there? We got it. Got it. Yes. Jenny Council, Jenny Prosser, General <laughs> Council, Secretary of State's office. And yes, my understanding matches what Chris just articulated that um, under former temporary law that allowed remote only meetings and under this bill as well, it would be an option for towns to hold a fully remote meeting by telephone only. I think the language I have to look at it, the language is by electronic means, which would, as is in my function, as I, I think, ask Tucker actually to, to clarify for sure, but that that would also, um, that, that would allow just phones or a mix of phones and say, you know, what we're doing right now, Zooming, um, but, but in any event, phones would be necessary. Okay. Thank you for helping with that clarification. Thank you, Jenny. Tucker, anything you want to add on that one? I think Jenny did a great job. Really, as long as uh, you meet the underlying requirements of the open meeting law, specifically that the members of the public body can hear what's happening and be heard and announce themselves, then you could have a fully telephonic meeting. And that is something that was already embedded in the open meeting law prior to this temporary authority. Wonderful, thank you so much. And this may be a question, a larger committee discussion question. And I personally don't have any issue having you know January be the end date to this temporary provision. And there's a lot of discussion right now so that bodies don't have to keep revisiting this about linking this kind of change these temporary COVID related changes to the to specific data. And I wonder if you have any way in on if that would make sense here or if it just makes sense to set a specific date. Yeah, I, I would just say that we were we were pondering that um, in the late fall and, and early winter, wondering how we could how what, what's the what's the appropriate end date and could we tie it to some sort of data? Um, it's my understanding that there are things like uh, mask ma mandates in a few states where they, they do tie it to actual maybe CDC data. I don't know what data they use. We kicked that around a little bit and, and just felt that it was too difficult to match up. And you also wouldn't want it to be, if you're on the edge of a certain number, to going off and on, off and on would be kind of confusing to people. And so they landed on the let's just do it straight on until... January. And again, this is permissive for towns to do. It's not, not mandatory, but it's permissive for them to eliminate the physical meeting location. Great. Thank you. Representative Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I actually think it was a wise decision to, to allow remote meeting through January 2023. Every time we think this pandemic's over, it's not. Um, so, but that's not my question. My question actually is with respect to the criteria, if a town decides to hold its meetings fully remotely, and that's the third criteria, which is posting the information um, about electronic access. Um, does that mean like posting the Zoom link without any password protection? And th the reason I ask that is, you know, I think there are some communities like Burlington where some of their meetings get disruptive. Um, and I was just wondering if, if there's a concern about Zoom bombing or other ways that people may disrupt a, a, a meeting. I can relay my <clears throat> recollection of, of that conversation and maybe Tucker or, or Jenny could join in after to, to see if I got any of it wrong. But I think the conversation was around, you know, early on, as we all fondly remember, I'm sure there was Zoom bombing was a real problem where passwords were out there. Um, people were joining meetings and, and uh, doing inappropriate things and disrupting meetings. 
So there was a move toward um, not including all of that information in the meeting notices. Um, since then, I think we've all learned a little bit better about um, moderating meetings and how to allow people in, how to block them, how to shut them down quickly. Um, and in the meantime, when that information is not posted in the meeting notice, we've heard some stories of people who you know, decided at the last minute, yeah, I guess I'll go attend that meeting. And the meeting notice says, uh, call the town clerk's office or call the superintendent's office for um, meeting on how to access the Zoom or information on how to access the Zoom. And the office might be closed. So they're effectively shut out of that meeting. Uh, so that was some of the back and forth that happened in the Senate Government Operations Committee. And ultimately the committee decided to um, actually require that information on how to access the meeting needs to be in the meeting notice. Great, thank you. Any other committee questions for the deputy secretary? All right, uh, thank you, Chris, for being with us today and Jenny as well, please hang tight. And, uh, we'll, uh, we may come back to you with other questions. Um, next, I'd like to hear from the League of Cities and Towns. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, please share with us your thoughts on the bill as written. Um, and, you know, feel free to enlighten us on, on how you weighed in on any of the dialogue that happened in the Senate Government Operations Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Karen Horn with the League of Cities and Towns and Gwyn is here as well today. Um, we did support um, H-222 in the Senate. We're um, very grateful that you're again taking the time to take this bill up uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, we're, we were just reading this morning that last Friday we had 3,000 cases. It's a little crazy now. So um, we, uh, we do support the bill as written. I did want to just um, comment a little bit on the letter from Mr. Weiss, who's a resident in Montpelier, civil engineer in Montpelier. And um, there, there are situations um, uh, where under any circumstance, somebody might not be able to get to a meeting. If you have a physical location, someone needs a car or public transportation or some means to get to that physical location. We're thinking that right now, given the risk of um, Omicron and, and the way that's progressing in Vermont, it's more important uh, to assure that, that local boards and local officials are able to, to um, be safe essentially. Um, and right now the bill is written as a temporary measure through 2023, through January, 2023. That date was chosen in the end because the Senate after some discussion uh, realized that they might be busy in April of 2022 and um, that then they would be gone. And given the pattern of surges of um, coronavirus in the fall, as people move indoors, that it might be best to extend this till January 23 when you're back in session. I would just note that um, we would love at some point to have the discussion about making this a permanent uh, feature of the open meeting law as has been recommended by the climate action plan, but that's a discussion for another day. So I, if you have questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you, Karen. Um, give committee members a moment to, uh, to raise their hand if they have any questions. All right, seeing none, thank you. Um, I think that it would be helpful to hear from uh, Sarah Bruce, would, who is with us from the Hartford, um, Heartland, sorry, Heartland Energy Committee um, and uh, welcome. And we would love to hear your um, thoughts on this bill. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Sarah Bruce. I am a resident of Heartland um, and I am currently chair of our energy committee. Um, I have six members on our committee. 
and all of them prefer virtual meetings. This is in large part because of our goal and the state's goal to reduce energy consumption. Uh, Karen Horn just referred to that in the action, Climate Action Plan and the Comprehensive Energy Plan. However, the open meeting laws, which I actually think are very good and have great respect for, they require a minimum of one person at the physical, at the publicly announced physical location. Uh, since nobody on my committee wants to do that um, as chair by default, I'm it. So I am in the physical location, which is our library. And um, energy committee meetings aren't a big draw, shall we say. So we don't usually have a lot of public coming. But that does not eliminate my concern that if somebody comes to the library, a member of the public, a member of a resident of Heartland, comes to attend the meeting, and let's say they're not wearing a mask, um, and perhaps they decline to wear a mask even if I have one to provide for them. How do I know it's vaccinated? They are now in the room with me for 90 minutes or sometimes a little longer. So I, what I really appreciate the attempt here is that that addresses that concern. And I know that concern is not limited to me. I think it's also true for many other committees, not just in Heartland, but in multiple towns. And um, with regards to the time frame of this, the one other point that I would like to make is that from my perspective, and I am a biologist, um, we will be dealing with COVID for quite a while. Um, we deal with the Omicron right now, but then we will deal with future variants. As long as we allow this virus to be transmitted within the population and in many ways, countrywide and worldwide, the virus will be transmitted, the virus will therefore replicate, and this allows for mutations to generate new variants. So I think it's unrealistic to think that all we have to do is get through Omicron because we don't know what's coming next. So I fully support the efforts here. And I think we have to think a little bit longer term than just the next few months when Omicron might calm down. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I appreciate you coming to share your perspective. Um, uh, Karen Horn, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you. Sarah's testimony does remind me of one other point that we wanted to make, which is that when you have a single person in a physical location in an otherwise empty building at night, there are some other basic security concerns that can arise and have arisen for some um, members of boards around the state. Thank you. Fair enough. Um, questions from committee members. All right, we have a, a collection of other folks with us as well who, um, who I think maybe are primarily here to speak to 223, but um, would pause here to allow you to raise your hand if you wanted to weigh in on, on open meetings and physical location as well. All right. Uh, shifting gears then, let's... Uh, Let's run through the run of show again on S-223. Um, uh, this is the bill that, uh, that deals with a couple of other lingering um, issues around annual meetings this year at a time uh, when we're experiencing such a surge in COVID cases. And um, Deputy Secretary, I think we'll just throw it back to you to lead off from the top of the list. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, round two here. This is another um, very fast moving bill. And again, thank you. We thank the Senate for their quick work on it and for you for taking it up so quickly. Uh, this has two very basic provisions in it. There are additional concerns that were being raised as you were moving the um, initial, what we saw as the most important town meeting bill through your committee last week. Um, the two provisions are to waive petition signatures for local candidates for uh, annual meeting only, um, and also to uh, allow for a waiver 
of the commingling of ballots for those school districts where their articles of agreement might require them to uh, mix their ballots together and count them so that no one town's results are, are made publicly known. Um, there was a, certainly a groundswell of support for doing something to address these two issues. Um, it, to be honest, we didn't um, think that they were uh, big issues as we started the legislative session, or we perhaps would have included them in the, in the initial town meeting day bill, but we've heard from a number of people with legitimate concerns both about collecting signatures and about being uh, put in a situation where they have to count ballots with a lot of other individuals. So increased exposure uh, to other people in this time of a uh, surging um, COVID numbers didn't make a lot of sense for some. So um, we put together this, uh, sent, uh, Tucker Anderson very quickly put together this bill, Senate took it up and um, I think passed it as, as it was drafted. Um, and so this is before you, we support what's in this bill. We um, do think that the waiver of petition signatures ought to be limited to local candidates. And I would um, urge you to hear from some of the town clerks and uh, I believe select board members who are here to, um, to discuss their concerns and, and why they would have you uh, pass this bill as well. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'll just note that Will Senning has just just joined us. Um, and if you have some election specific questions, Will would be happy to answer as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Higley has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this may be a question for both uh, Chris and Tucker. Uh, in reading through the wording in regards to the co-mingling piece, um, it talks about how um, the legislative body of a school district uh, may vote that the ballots for the 22 annual district meetings shall not be commingled. Um, but then it goes on to say the ballots may be counted by each member town. Um, I guess uh, to me, it reads a little bit conflicting. It sounds like, you know, the school district, you know, um, may, may take a vote uh, that they shall not commingle Yet it goes on to say that uh, the ballots may be counted by each member town. Um, am I wrong in that? And, and uh, does that allow a, a town to uh, say that they're not gonna count them, they'd still want them to be commingled? I will defer to either Tucker or perhaps to Will Senning. Uh, this language came from our office from the directive that we issued last year under our temporary elections procedures. And that's what I think Tucker used in this spot in the bill. Um, maybe Will, you could speak to the, what, what's intended there. The intent is for the decision to be solely with the school board. And then I think that second sentence is kind of a, is a, in that case the ballots may be counted in the member towns. That's it's as opposed to bringing them to a central location. It's saying they may be counted in their dispersed member town locations. I see so, Tucker nodding. If he thinks it could be refined, I would leave that up to him to, to better express that intent. I would agree that the intent of this is that first you have the permissive step where the school district may vote to not commingle the ballots that come from the member municipalities. And that the second clause is contingent on that permissive vote. Uh, however, Representative Higley, I would agree that it would be much clearer if that may was a shall and there was a lead in clause that says, if the school district so votes or something along those lines, the ballots shall be counted by each member town and the results reported to the school district clerk. Uh, however, um, I think you may want to hear some background on how this works out practically before taking that step to mandate that the ballots be counted at the municipal level, uh, contingent on the permissive vote from the school district. Okay, thank you, Tucker. Other questions from committee members? 
All right. Um, next, I would like to hear uh, the clerk's perspective. And we have uh, Carol Dawes of the Clerks and Treasurers Association uh, and also representing a larger community and Bobby Brimblecombe, who represents uh, one of our smaller communities. So um, Carol, why don't you go ahead first and, uh, and then we'll go to Bobby. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we actually represent different uh, sides of the coins, which is great because I don't, as a general rule, I don't commingle ballots, but Bobby does. So she'll be able to speak to the sort of normal practice associated with that. Um, with regards to the uh, nominating petitions, um, we certainly support um, waiving them for the local offices uh, for this year to limit um, people interacting, uh, not having to collect the signatures. Obviously, they'll, the candidates will have to submit their consent of candidate form, so we will have some kind of documentation on file about putting names on the ballots. Um, so we do support that. Um, with regards to commingling, um, it, and as I said, Bobby will, will talk about sort of the normal process uh, associated with that. Um, but I represent a, a group of um, wearing a different hat than VMCTA. Um, I represent a group of 18 towns that are in a unique position this year. Um, we are, uh, there has been warned a um, creation vote for the Center of Vermont Career Center. Um, and there are slightly different statutes that control the creation of a career center, uh, those elections. And the, between the statute and the Articles of Agreement, um, it requires the 18 towns to commingle their ballots. Uh, and the statutory language specifically says that representatives from those 18 towns will all get together at the same time and place to commingle those ballots. Um, and I have concerns about grouping together a bunch of people, uh, not only to feed the ballots through the tabulator, but also they all they will include uh, school board members on them. We'll have to review them all for uh, for write-ins. Um, so I, I do have some concerns about that. Um, the Perhaps one way around that would be to clarify that we don't have to do it all at one, at one place at one time. If we could spread it out during the 10 days that we have between the election and when the election has to be certified, you know, a town, I could have two towns a day come bring their ballots to me because they will be commingled in Barry City. There, I think there are ways uh, around it to continue to um, uh, uh, respect the intention of the planning committee that, that wants the ballots commingled so as not to have um, individual community results. They want to be able to think of everything as one district. Um, and, but I think there's ways that we can do that and yet still provide for the safety of the representatives from the 18 different municipalities. Representative Higley has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is probably a question for you, Carol. A, a question was asked, I believe yesterday, uh, wasn't for me, but I've got it written down about uh, the security of the, the ballots that are counted by each town. Uh, again, uh, can you fill me in as to uh, what that looks like when those ballots are all at the different towns? And if somebody wants the results or information from uh, those towns, is it readily available? And uh, yeah, the security is an important issue, I guess. Yep, um, under the com the the commingling process, what would happen is that in each of those towns, they would, of course, be counting their town meeting ballots, their local school ballots or their local school district ballots. But with regards to these Central Vermont Career Center ballots, they would be a completely separate document. And in those towns, they would just be dropping those ballots. The voters would just be dropping those ballots in a ballot box. They wouldn't be going through a tabulator. They just would be going in a secured ballot box. At the conclusion of the election, they would be transferred into a ballot bag where they would be sealed. 
then they would be brought to the poles or brought to my location for commingling, then run through the tabulator. Um, after they have been reviewed for write-ins, they would be rebagged, resealed, excuse me, and would um, then go back to their uh, member town for, uh, for storage for the, the 90 day um, storage period. So under, once a school district is ex in existence, then the ballots are school stored by the, um, the clerk of the school district. But since this is a unique situation where we're talking about the creation of a district, uh, the ballots would go back to all the individual communities. Is there a period of time that they're required to uh, keep and store those uh, uh, ballots securely? 90 days. Okay, thank you. Local elections are 90 days. All right, um, Bobby, thank you for being with us and um, please do share your perspective on, uh, on either of these issues in, the, in 223. I, I, I think most small towns will support both of these measures. Um, to give you a little perspective on how we count our school ballots, typically Marshfield has an open meeting. So we have our floor vote and we may have um, an Australian ballot for zoning issues and for our solid waste district. Plainfield, the other town in our district has Australian ballot voting for their officers. So at the end of the night at seven o'clock when the polls close, they separate all of their town and school ballots into two separate um, boxes, make sure, making sure they have all the school ballots and then they, send their justices of the peace to Marshfield. And we sit down together, put all the ballots from both towns together and count them. But we don't feel that that's a safe option now with COVID, we would rather not have JPs from different towns having to sit down together to count. We did vote not to commingle last year under the emergency provisions it worked very well marshfield counted marshfield ballots plainfield counted plainfield ballots and we both reported our results to the school district clerk and we didn't hear any any negative issues with that we just feel like in these times it's not really it's not a good idea to encourage people to gather if it's not necessary and as far as the petitions, no one in Marshfield has ever had to gather a petition. We've never, we do all of our officer votes from the floor and the same is true of our school district. And assuming, I don't know if the governor has signed S-172 yet, but if he has, the school district will be doing Australian ballot for their officers as well. And we only have until January 24th to gather signatures. It's, it's a lot to ask people to do right now. And I worry the fear level in our community is so high. I worry that requiring signatures will make people not, not take up office. I think there are people that won't be willing to run if it means they have to go. We're in the middle of a reappraisal and it's causing a lot of angst. People don't want appraisers coming on their property. I can't imagine that they're gonna feel comfortable going around gathering signatures. And I think that would bar people from running. Thank you, Representative Higley. Uh, thanks again, Madam Chair. Um, Bobby, in regards to, you know, that, that January 24th date being of course gone, uh, if this was passed, uh, the, there is, there must be uh, a time frame for you to get those names on the um, on the um, Australian ballot. Uh, it, is that is that different for each town, or is that is there is something you still have to abide by? We still have to have the the local ballots ready a number of days before the election, especially since we're trying to encourage absentee ballots. We want the ballots ready as soon as possible. So, so, so does each so, town make that determination? It's statutory. The deadline 
of January 24th is in the statute. So folks still have to get their names in by January 24th to get on that uh, that, that ballot, that Australian ballot. Okay. Yep, right. Thanks. It's just if they only have to do a consent of candidate form, they can do it safely. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Carol, I saw your hand up. Did you, were you answering that question or did you have something else you wanted to share? I, I was answering the question, but Bobby beat me to it. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, Will Senning. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just a quick follow up on that one. Bobby's correct. It is um, statutory rep Higley. 20 days before the election is the deadline to have the ballots prepared. January 24th which is the sixth Monday before the election, that is in statute as the date that the candidate consent forms need to be filed. So, you know, you get your candidates filed by January 24th, and then there's what you guys, a couple weeks between then and 20 days before the election when the ballots technically have to be ready. <clears throat> but what I really wanted to point out, so Bobby was accurate there, in the previous emergency legislation that you passed, the one bit of waiver authority that's provided to our office in that legislation, sorry, I was just making sure I was right that that was the first bill, um, allows my office to waive particularly those deadlines that are related to an Australian ballot election for any towns that move articles from a floor meeting to an Australian ballot this year pursuant to that emergency authority. So say they don't get around to making the decision or the there's a delay in the bill being signed. Um, if they are right up against some of those deadlines, you've left it up to my office to say, you can have another five days before your candidates file or whatever we work out with that town is reasonable for their circumstances. Go ahead, Rep Higley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That helps me, uh, again, for my own benefit, um, if a town chooses to move either one or the other or both of their, their meetings to let's say a uh, May date, um, you're still saying that um, you know, it, they need to 20 days before that election uh, get their names in so they can get on that ballot, correct? Yes, and thank you, Rep. Higley. That's another good, important note to make for everybody. If they take advantage of the provision that moves the date, what's nice about those provisions in the law is that they're not specific dates. They're tied to the date of the election. So it becomes 20 days before that date you moved it to or six Mondays before that date you moved it to. Thank you. Representative LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so when we heard from Secretary Condos back on the 5th, I believe, he gave us a really nice layout also of um, the elections backing up from the general election. Would there be something that could be put together by either Mr. Winters or Mr. Sunning that would give us this detailed information to also be able to assist towns with um, those numbers or those dates, I apologize, those dates. For sure, Rep Lefebvre, and just on top of that, they're gonna get a lot of communication from my office with reminders about those dates and deadlines, but definitely. Um, go ahead, Bobby. Oh, you were unmuted before and you re-muted yourself accidentally. <laughs> Technology's grand, you would think after two years. Um, I just wanted to point out, we did discuss the option of postponing our town meetings so that we could give people time to do a petition when they felt like it was safer. But because of the Central Vermont Career Center vote, that vote will happen on March 1st. And we thought it would be not a good idea to have a meeting in March and then another meeting in April or May. Since we have to gather in March, let's only do it once. Makes sense. Um, committee members, any other questions? And um, League of Cities and Towns, Karen Horn, do you want to weigh in on this bill? Uh, thank you. Uh, we are supportive of 
of this bill and um, again, urge you to pass it as soon as possible because of the um, deadline for collecting signatures next Monday, which has been discussed already. So thank you. Absolutely. All right, um, committee, any other perspectives you need to hear in order to feel comfortable with these two bills? All right, so Representative Merwicki is going to, oh, Representative Lefebvre. Sorry, I was not fast. Um, I would just like to highlight that we did get written testimony from someone that did not oppose this, I mean, did not support this. Um, that they opposed how fast this came out of the Senate. Um, I think it was S222 um, that they opposed, if I'm recollecting correctly. Um, and I, I do um, I do also would like to have a little bit more committee discussion um, about S222, um, S223. Um, I feel much more comfortable with besides the fact um, I don't, I would, would like one more reminder from Mr. Anderson, if this would also be able to do anything with people wanting to put, um, asking for donations for their um, charities, if they would have to still have um, signatures or if they could just submit us their ask. So I did go back and take a look at what we did last year with this specific issue. And uh, the wet ink signature requirement for those petitions would remain in place. This bill does not suspend them. They were not suspended under the previous authority. And the reason for that, at least according to the notes that I kept from last year, is that the legislative body of each municipality has the ability to add those articles on their own motion. So no petition needs to be submitted in order for the legislative body to add those articles uh, to the ballot. Uh, if you were to suspend the 5% of the voters minimum threshold uh, requirement, then effectively one ind individual voter could petition and have an article placed on the ballot for the annual meeting. So uh, there likely would, you want some middle ground there if that's something you want to pursue. But again, that was not part of last year's temporary authority and this bill would not waive uh, those particular signature requirements. Thank you. All right, um, just reminding committee members that we have two different um, tracks here that we have possession of 222 and, uh, and therefore we can take an immediate vote on that. And we have, um, we expect to be referred uh, to 223 when we get onto the floor, at which point if, uh, if everything is going as we hope it will, um, the speaker would uh, ask for a rule suspension to take that up. So uh, what I'd like to do right now is take a motion on um, 222 so that we can finish our work on that and continue to discuss uh, 223 if folks have lingering questions. So Representative Merwicki. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to move that we approve S222 as it came over from the Senate. All right, any further committee discussion? Representative Lefebvre. Um, I would ask that we take a look at the date of how long we are um, allowing this out to um, and ask that we reconsider this before January 15th of 2023. A lot could happen between now and then. Um, yeah, it would be my intention that um, in April, um, <laughs> knocking on wood after we finish redistricting and before adjournment, um, that we would take a look at whether we can imagine some sort of metric that, that could be used in order to um, uh, roll this back before next January. Um, if that is the will of the committee. So I would absolutely, um, you know, commit to having that conversation in April and would invite any of the folks who are 
on the call with us today to uh, to give that some thought as to what you think might be a reasonable um, trigger in the event that we decided we wanted to um, roll back that um, that open meeting requirement before January. Any other committee discussion? All right, Representative Colston, if you're ready. I shall begin the roll call. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. McClare. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Pihovsky. Yes. Lefebvre. No. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Copeland Hanses. Yes. And I would ask that we just keep this vote open for a few minutes um, in the event that Rep McCarthy comes back. He had indicated earlier that he thought he might be able to be here around two. Um, okay. So let's just hold that open for a moment. Rep Merwicki, hang tight. Um, we might be able to get all 11 committee members uh, weighing in on this. Um, additional committee discussion. Oh, Rep Colston. Um, Madam Chair, I, I missed the conversation yesterday about this. So who was selected as the reporter? Uh, Representative Merwicki is going to report this bill. Um, and, uh, and in case, folks hadn't figured it out, um, I, I asked Rep Higley if he'd be willing to report the next bill, um, which is possibly why he was asking all the really good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I see that um, Rep McCarthy has joined us. Um, Rep McCarthy, we have just uh, kept open the vote on S-222. Um, if you would care to vote on this bill, um, the uh, temporary elections procedures relating to open meeting law. I would, thank you. McCarthy, is that a yes? Yes. Thank you. So the, <clears throat> the bill passes 10-1-0. Um, Great. Thank you much. Um, so uh, representatives Colston and Merwicki, you'll need to communicate that with the clerk's office um, as quickly as you are able to sort of in the background here um, in the event that we get rules suspension to bring this up today. Um, so committee discussion on 223. Um, we wanna be poised and ready if we get a recess on the floor to act on this. So. What other questions do folks have? What other perspectives would you like to hear? Excellent. All right. Um, I wanna thank all of the assembled witnesses who came to share their, uh, their experience and wisdom and perspective on these bills and um, you can tune into the House floor later today. I, I hope and expect that, um, that we will be able to move these bills along so that the communities have what they need in order to safely conduct annual meetings and, um, and regular meetings in this really challenging time. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Okay, so committee, um, that is all we have for, uh, for work at the moment on these two issues. And I just wanted to come back um, and make sure that we covered any other um, budget adjustment related questions that folks had, or if you had any thoughts during your lunch break. Um, Representative Merwicki. Thank you. I I did have thoughts about that, and I think I mentioned I'm going to try and get a hold of Representative Townsend. But I I do hope we can keep the the money in the in that budget for those two positions that, that they had been asking for. I, I'm not sure the rationale for pulling at so quickly. Um, so that's my take on it. Thank you. 
Uh, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to confirm, that was the only, that, those two positions were what they were asking for and everything else that was being asked on the wish list was just to be added after, but for what we are concerned with the, the Budget Adjustment Act was those two positions being taken away from them. Um, I think it was the, uh, oh, Representative Gannon might have a, a thought on this. So uh, based on my communications with Representative Townsend, um, so, you know, the, we're talking about the Vin Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, they have a, a total appropriation for FY21 of $2.6 million. Um, there was a carry forward of $276,000 um, forward to FY22. Um, and so the, the administration only reverted $62,000 of that amount. Um, um, and that's because um, uh, as part of the carry forward process, uh, you know, wants to ensure that the monies can, won't obligate future state expenditures. And so the only reason it wasn't carried forward was because it could commit future expenditures. It, it's, well, the, there was a large amount that was carried forward and that was because there was open positions um, based on my email with Representative Townsend, it, this isn't taking away positions from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. So I, I'm a little confused by um, the, the, the statements here today that positions are being taken away. Because most of that money was because the ED position did not fill as quick, quickly as they anticipated. As we know, that position is now filled. Representative Vahovsky. Um, I certainly understand why there is extra money. And I guess my question, given that we heard even in testimony today from the Criminal Justice Council that they need resources if, if we can't allow them to keep that money to utilize towards some of the other things that they're saying they need resources for. Uh, it is a, a, a concern that, um, you know, that this isn't the first time we've heard them articulate that um, that they have been unable to achieve a legislative directive because of uh, shortages and resources. So um, it's it's hard to square this circle at this moment that we uh, that we would support um, a proposal to take money back out of their budget um, when we know they have some tasks that they haven't been able to get to. Other committee discussion? Representative Anthony. You beat me to it. <clears throat> I, uh, perhaps some of my colleagues could refresh my memory. <clears throat> it wasn't clear to me that the curricular preparation for a lot of the work revolving around sensitivity to minorities was already, pardon the phrase, in the can or not. And I'm, I'm wondering whether, uh, and this goes back to an earlier conversation um, last uh, session, uh, whether the, the revision of the money is in recognition of um, not, not having prepared, if you will, to put those positions to work because the curricular is the curriculum is not completed. Uh, somebody could help me out on that. I'm I'm not sure what, frankly, the flexibility in the current appropriation is to prepare uh, the Justice Council to, in fact, put those two positions and that money to work uh, if it goes if it is not swept in the Budget Adjustment Act. I'm not sure that I can um, enlighten on that point, but let's put that in the hopper. And um, Rep. Gannon, were you were you raising your hand to respond specifically to that? Yes, Madam Chair, I was. Um, 
based on the information that Representative Townsend gave me, which came directly from Heather and Mike Manley, um, th the money that's reverted has nothing to do um, with open positions, except for the executive director position. Um, the, the money, the, the large carry forward was a result of uh, uh, reduced expenses due to COVID, um, vacancy savings from the ED position, um, difficulties making purchases and man managing grants in the absence of an executive director. Those are the reasons stated. It, it has nothing to do with two, two positions. Um, from what Representative Townsend um, deduced from her conversations with Heather Simons and Mike Manley. And I just add, if we wanna have a discussion about the staffing of Vermont Criminal Justice Council, I think the, the time to do that is with respect to looking at the budget, not a budget adjustment act um, change. Right, and the lingering question in my mind is um, uh, when we were talking earlier, um, the statement was made that, uh, that they have a fair and impartial police trainer who's going around the state and, and, um, and helping to get agencies um, their trainer at training and refreshers on fair and impartial policing and um, you know, to the extent that we want them to do that and do it faster, um, would having access to this $65,000, $68,000 be helpful. Um, and, you know, they're also talking about wanting to, um, you know, parallel some of the training that they do with new recruits in the academy around, you know, sort of the history of policing and, and um, you know, the history of racial bias in the country. And, and uh, Christopher Brickell was talking about wanting to make sure that they extend that to sort of mid-level supervisors as well as um, managerial uh, level uh, law enforcement officers. And, uh, and again, that would be a priority that I would prefer other over almost anything that I could imagine doing with this, um, this $68,000. So, uh, Representative Lafave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Gannon, could you give me those numbers that you had in the beginning one more time? Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so the overall appropriations for the Vermont Criminal Justice Council was 2.6 million for FY21. There was a carry forward of $276,000 um, of which $62,049 was reverted to the, the general budget, general fund. Other committee discussion? Representative Higley. This is on a different subject, just thinking ahead a little bit. Uh, so when we request that uh, 223 uh, come before us, we're gonna break and, and then I'm assuming go back. Uh, what's the best place to tell folks uh, to find this? Is it, would it be our January 11th committee page under uh, Tucker Anderson, or is there a better, better place to tell folks? Um, either that or uh, as past the Senate. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the Senate GovOps page also has the bill. I, I think it probably would be helpful and I can do it as soon as we get off of committee, probably would be helpful just to send um, these bills out to all house just so they have them. Great, thanks. All right, committee discussion. Uh, anybody wanna make a recommendation on how we move forward with respect to the budget adjustment question that we've been chewing on? I guess, Madam Chair, if you're looking for a motion to approve 
or a straw poll. Uh, don't know which, but um, I guess I would I would uh, uh, approve of uh, of the consideration that uh, we've been talking about. Um, so, would you approve of us recommending to the appropriations committee that um, that the criminal justice council retain their budget carry forward and use it towards um, police training? Uh, no, I thought I would be supporting the Appropriations Committee and their request to uh, send some of it back to the general fund. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on which side of this question we were talking. Other committee discussion? And I, if that is going to confuse things, Madam Chair, I would uh, I would certainly uh, remove my motion and and wait for another motion to come forward. Well, we've got some hands up now, Representative Gannon. Let's see if we can uh, clarify this. Um, I, I'm actually very supportive of Representative Higley's motion. Um, I think we would need to take more testimony um, if we want to um, explain to appropriations why um, this money shouldn't revert to the general fund. Um, so, I mean, I, I am sympathetic to, to the needs of more training. I'm just concerned that um, <laughs> we don't have sufficient information to provide appropriations as to why it should not revert at this point. And we're running out of time. Representative Anthony. Uh, ditto, <clears throat> which is why I <clears throat> asked a rather confusing uh, question about recollections because I just, I couldn't follow it this morning. I was, I was unconvinced, frankly. Uh, I know they have tasks they need to complete, but boy, I didn't, I didn't see a roadmap for this 68,000. Any other committee discussion? All right, I think we can uh, straw poll a, a communication back through Representative Townsend um, and, um, and Rep Higley's motion was to, uh, to support the budget adjustment recommendation that scoops the $68,000. Any other committee discussion about that? All right, if you are in favor of that, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I see seven. All right, if you are opposed to that. Two. And we must be missing two committee members. Okay, excellent. Um, Representative Gannon, would you um, be so kind as to communicate that to Representative Townsend on the Appropriations Committee? I know that you, you and she have been exchanging emails about this. Yes, I will. All right. Excellent. Any other questions, comments, committee discussion? Are we poised and ready to act on S-223 when the, when the House takes a recess? All right. Well, we have gained ourselves a little bit of time to, uh, to get some constituent service done with, between now and three o'clock, and I'll see you. Thank you.